video, we're going to introduce the concept of mathematical induction, which is closely related to what we've discussed so far with sequences and series. So the following sums can be verified for these special sequences known as arithmetic and geometric sequences which we discussed at length in the last two videos. So we know if we were to take the terms in an arithmetic sequence and add up the first n terms resulting in what we refer to as the nth partial sum or the finite series associated with adding up the first n terms, then we get a value that's equivalent to n divided by two times the sum of the first term and the nth term. And if we have a geometric sequence and we add up and find the um, nth partial sum, then we know that comes out to the first term times one minus the common ratio to the nth power divided by the quantity one minus the common ratio. So although we didn't verify these formulas, these formulas are known to be true. And so what's the value of formulas like this? Well, it saves us major amounts of time. So suppose, for instance, we wanted to take an arithmetic sequence and add up the first thousand terms. If we wanted to do by, that by hand, that would, of course, be very cumbersome. The benefit of using a formula like this is it tells us what the value is going to be in a concise form. So rather than having to add up a thousand terms, all we need to know is that n is going to be 1,000, and then we need to know where the series is going to start and where the series is going to end. And based on our knowledge of that, we can find the value for the thousandth partial sum. Same kind of thing for a geometric sequence. However, in most cases, for just a generic sequence, we don't actually have formulas readily available to use as shortcuts in the same kind of manner. So if we wanted to add up terms in just a generic sequence that doesn't fit one of these categories, then in most cases we have to add all the terms up by hand. However, we can use what's referred to as the principle of mathematical induction to prove the validity of statements involving these kinds of sums. Now I do want to preface our discussion by pointing out that this is not going to give us a technique to come up with formulas on our own. There's a lot of more mathematics behind actually developing formulas like this. What the principle of mathematical induction is going to do for us is it's going to allow us to take a proposed formula and verify that that formula is in fact true, that it does actually represent um, such a sum in a concise manner. So first off, what is the principle of mathematical induction? So we're going to list it out formally and then we'll go into more detail about the practicality of actually using the principle of mathematical induction. So we're going to let P sub N be a statement involving the positive integer N. Now statement can mean a variety of different things. It could just be a sentence related to positive integers. It could be an algebraic sentence, AKA an equation. Essentially, it's some relationship we want to prove the validity of um, in the sense that the relationship involves positive integers, the generic positive integer n. And we're also going to assign another variable, k, and we're just going to let that be an arbitrary positive integer. p sub n, our statement, is true for all positive integers n. In other words, it's true in general if the following two conditions are met. So the first condition is that p sub one must be true. In other words, the case where n is equal to one, the most basic, the first case of the statement of the relationship must be true. So that is a requirement. And then the second condition is that the truth of the generic statement p sub k implies the truth of the following statement p sub k plus one. So the first statement has to be true, the version of the statement we get when n is equal to one, it must be true. And the truth of any individual statement must imply the truth of the following statement. And if we can show that these two conditions hold, then that is essentially using the principle of mathematical induction to show that the statement is going to be true in general for any positive integer n. So let's break this down a little bit and let's talk a little bit more about what this actually means and how we're going to use this idea.
So what is the goal? The ultimate goal is to show that a statement involving positive integers is true, is legitimate, in general. In other words, for all such numbers, for all positive integers. And the statement that we want to prove the validity of is what we call P sub N. And again, statement can mean a variety of different things. It could just be a sentence um, expressing a relationship among positive integers. It can be an equation that we want to prove to be true. Regardless, we represent it as P sub N um, in a concise way. So the first thing we need to show is that the statement is true when n is equal to 1. In other words, in the most basic situation. So we have to, ver to verify that p sub 1, whatever that looks like, is in fact a true statement. We're then going to assume, we're going to make an assumption that the generic statement p sub k is true for an arbitrary value K. So K is going to be variable. We're not going to pick a specific value. We're going to treat it as a variable version of that statement. And we're going to assume that that statement is true, whatever that happens to look like. Now this is what we call the inductive hypothesis. This is specific to this technique of using mathematical induction. So it's a hypothesis in the sense that we're currently assuming it to be true, and then we're going to either prove or disprove its truth. So once we make this assumption, this inductive hypothesis, we're going to use the assumption of truth, assuming that the statement is true, to show that the truth of the statement we assumed results in the following statement, p sub k plus 1, the next case up also being true. And typically this is going to be the most challenging step in the process we use when we use mathematical induction, showing that one case implies the truth of the next. But when we put those three pieces together, this is essentially what we have. We know that p sub 1 is true, and we know that any individual case implies the truth of the next case up, which would be the k plus 1 case. Well, that means if p sub 1 is true, which again we verified, then that implies that p sub 2 must be true because 1 in case implies the next. Well, if p sub 2 is true, then that means p sub 3 must be true because again, 1 case implies the truth of the next, and then so on and so forth. And we don't have to actually manually show that each individual case implies the next because what we're doing in this step right here is we're showing that one case implies the other just for an arbitrary value for k, which means what we show is going to be true in general. It's not true for a specific number. It's true for any number that we could substitute in for k. And that is essentially tantamount to showing that the statement is true in all cases. It's true in general. So if we can show that the most basic case is true, and we can show that any one individual general case implies the truth of the following case, then that proves that the statement is going to be true in general. So this is a very powerful technique that's used in real mathematics. Real mathematicians use this particular technique to show that statements are true, whatever that happens to look like in their specific case. So we're going to go through several, several examples to see what this looks like. And again, keep in mind, uses for this kind of technique are varied, so we're just going to focus on relatively simple cases for our purposes. And it's going to be closely related to what we've talked about with sequences and series. So for our first example, we want to use mathematical induction to prove the following statement, the following relationship. So we want to prove that 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus all of the even integers up to the nth even integer, which is 2n, is equal to n times n plus 1. So what do we essentially want to show? We want to show that if we were to take the series gener generated by the n first even integers and add all of those numbers up, that that evaluates to the same thing as n times n plus 1. Why would we want to do something like this? Well, knowing this kind of relationship is true is a major time saver. Because again, what if we wanted to add up the first thousand even integers? 
Imagine what an undertaking that would be, actually manually doing that. Well, if we know there's a concise formula for evaluating that kind of series, then we can just use the formula rather than having to manually add up all of those numbers. So the goal is to show that this formula does in fact represent the result that we would get if we add up all the terms in this series. So we're going to prove this using mathematical induction. So the first thing we need to do is we need to show that this relationship is true for n equals 1. In other words, we want to show that p sub 1, the statement when n is equal to 1, is true. Now that essentially means we're going to look at the left hand side and the right hand side of this relationship individually and we want to show that both sides come out to the same value if we evaluate when n is equal to 1. So what about the left hand side? What about the sum? Well the sum is just the sum of the first n even integers well, when n is 1, that means we're just looking at 2 times 1. We're just looking at the first term in the series. So the sum is really just going to be 2 times 1, which is 2. Well, what is the expression on the right-hand side equal to if n is equal to 1? Well, n times n plus 1 is equal to 1 times 1 plus 1, which is equal to 1 times 2, which is equal to 2. And so based on the fact that the left-hand side, the actual sum, evaluates to 2, and the formula that we're using also evaluates to 2, that's our verification that p sub 1 is true. So because both sides are actually equal to the same thing, therefore, p sub 1 is true. So we've shown that this statement is true in the most basic case. So now we're going to use our inductive hypothesis. What is the inductive hypothesis? We want to assume that this generic relationship is true for some value k. So we want to assume that p sub k is true. And again, that is our inductive hypothesis. We're making the assumption and then using the assumption in an additional way. So what would p sub k look like? What are we assuming? What are we assuming is true? Well, we're going to express this relationship not using n, but using the value k. So if we're assuming that this relationship is true for an input of k, then we're assuming that 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus all the way up to the k, even integer, we're assuming that that sum is equal to k times k plus 1. We're making that assumption. We're making that assumption in order to show that this being true implies that the next case would also have to be true. So that's how we're going to use the inductive hypothesis. So we're assuming that this statement is true, the statement we would get if we allowed n to be k, we look at the generic kth case, and we want to show that the truth of the k case implies the truth of the next case, the case we would get if we used k plus 1. So this is typically going to be the most tedious, the most challenging part of the process, using the inductive hypothesis in order to show that one case implies the truth of the next. So the first thing we want to do is we want to write out the sum represented by p sub k plus 1. In other words, what does the left-hand side of the relationship look like if we're looking at the case involving k plus 1? Well, it's going to be 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus all the terms up to the k plus 1 term. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is if we're going all the way up to the k plus 1 term, that also has to include all the terms that precede it, which will include the term involving k. So to get up to the term involving k plus 1, we also have to have the term that made its way up to k, the preceding term where we finished um, with the preceding statement. 
And so we want to simplify this particular sum involving our inductive hypothesis. So ultimately, what is the goal? Well, the goal is to take this sum and show that it would evaluate to the expression associated with this formula if we were to allow k plus 1 to be the value in the formula. So out to the side, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make a note of what we expect to see once we verify that the relationship is true. In other words, what would this side, what would the right hand side of the expression look like if we were to use the value of k plus 1? Well, our n, of course, would be k plus 1, and then we would have k plus 1 plus 1, and of course all of that simplifies down to k plus 1 times k plus 2. So that is going to be what we expect to see, what we need to be able to simplify this sum to in order to show that this sum does in fact simplify using the formula that we have expressed above. Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to use our inductive hypothesis. We're going to use the assumption that the sum of the terms 2, 4, 6, 8, all the way up to the 2k term, we're going to use the assumption that that is actually equal to k times k plus 1. Well, notice again in our sum for k plus 1, we have all of those terms preceding the new term that was added on. So based on our assumption, Wherever we see those terms, we can also replace them with what we've assumed them to be equal to, which is k times k plus 1. So the first k terms in the series, I can replace with the expression that was associated with my inductive hypothesis, which leaves us with just the additional term that was added on, which is 2 times k plus 1. Okay, and notice that takes the sum and that simplifies it quite a bit just based on replacing everything with our inductive hypothesis. So now the goal is to show that this expression is really equivalent to this, which again was the version of the formula that we would get if we allowed n to be k plus 1 and we looked at this case specifically. So what I want you to notice now is that we have two big terms and each of them has a k plus 1 in common. So k plus 1, we can think of that as our greatest common factor, and we can factor it out. So I'm going to factor out that k plus 1 that those two terms have in common. Well, what does that leave me with? It leaves me with a k from the first term and a positive 2 from the second term. And so that is going to be the simplified version of our sum. And notice it's equal to exactly what we wanted it to be equal to. It's equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2, which was the version of our simplified formula that we would get for a value of k plus 1. And that, believe it or not, is our proof. So since p sub 1, the first case, is true, and since p sub k the generic case, the case associated with our inductive hypothesis, since that also implies that the following case would have to be true, that is enough using the principle of mathematical induction to conclude that our statement P sub n is true for all positive integers. So let's just walk through this one more time, at least from a structural standpoint. How is this actually true? What did we actually verify? Well, we verified that this statement was true when n was equal to 1, which is the starting case. That's the first case. So the left-hand side, the sum, and the right-hand side, the simplified formula, are the same thing when we look at the first case, when n is equal to 1. So the very first case, the most basic case, is true. And then we create what we call the inductive hypothesis. We're making an assumption. We're assuming that some generic case, any case we want, a generic case is true. In other words, we're assuming that this statement works for the arbitrary value k, which means we're adding up the k, the first k even integers, and we're assuming that that's going to be equal to 
the expression we have on the right hand side, which would be in this case k times k plus 1. By making that assumption, we're assuming that the truth of this statement, which again we're assuming, we're assuming that it's true, we're showing that by assuming that was true, the next case, the one associated with k plus 1, where we then add on that additional term, would come out to the version of the formula we need, the version of this formula, that we would get for the case when we have k plus 1. So the first case is true, and then any individual case implies that the next case will also be true. The formula assumed here implies that the next formula, um, the case for the next version of it would also be true. So case one would imply the truth of case two because any individual case implies the truth of the next case. So case one implies case two, case two implies case three. Every individual case implies the next and we know the first one is true, therefore all of them have to be true. So since our first case is true, and since we showed that one arbitrary case implies that the next one must be true, we can conclude that the statement is true in general. And that's pretty much what we're going to see any time. Every proof we do is going to be some variation of this kind of technique. Prove that the first case is true, assume that any generic case is true, and show that that truth implies that the next case would also have to be true, and that shows us that the relationship is true in general. So let's look at another example. Okay, so we want to use mathematical induction to prove that one over one minus two, or excuse me, one times two, plus one over two times three, plus one over three times four, we start to see the pattern, plus all of the integers or everything we would get if we added up the positive integers um, we're in, where we get up to n. So 1 over n times n plus 1. All of the terms that fit this particular form, we want to show that if we added up all of those terms, that the sum is equivalent to n over n plus 1. So in other words, rather than having to manually add up the terms, we could just plug in the value of n to this formula and find our sum that way. So we want to show first off that this relationship is true in the most basic case when n is equal to 1. Well when n is equal to 1 we're only adding up the first term. So the sum is going to be what we would get if we plugged in n is equal to 1 to our formula or to our sum which would be 1 over 1 times 1 plus 1 which is 1 over 1 times 2, which comes out to 1 half. Okay, so the sum evaluates to 1 half. What about the formula? Well, n over n plus 1 would equal to, when n is equal to 1, it would equal 1 over 1 plus 1, which also comes out to 1 half. So our sum is equal to one half, and the formula that we're supposing this sum is equal to is also equal to one half in this most basic case. Therefore, the relationship is true when n is equal to one. So p sub one is true. Okay, now we make our inductive hypothesis. So we want to assume that some generic case is true for some generic value k. In other words, we want to assume that this particular sum for the value k evaluates to this particular value expressed by our formula. So we're assuming that 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 plus all the terms added up to 1 over not n, but now we're looking at the k case, 1 over k times k plus 1 is equal to the value of this formula we would get when we allow our, vari our value to be k. So we assume that it adds up to k over k plus 1. Okay, so we're assuming 
that this relationship is true in order to show that the truth of this relationship implies the truth of the next relationship when k goes to k plus 1. So first off, what is the sum associated with k plus 1? Well, it's going to take all of these terms and we're going to go up to the value where n is equal to k plus 1. So that would be 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 plus all the terms we get when we go up to the k plus 1 term. Now keep in mind, again, we're adding on each time we generate a new version of the relationship, which means to get to the k plus 1 term, we need, also need the term associated with k, which would be the final term in the sum above. So we're also going to have to add up the term associated with k, which would be k times k plus 1, 1 over k times k plus 1, plus the term associated with k plus 1, which would be k plus 1, and then k plus 1 plus 1, which would be k plus 2, so 1 over that. So 1 over k plus 1 times k plus 2. Okay, that's going to be our sum based on a value of k plus 1. Now, what do we want to show? We want to show that this sum would evaluate to the same value expressed by this formula when n is equal to k plus 1. So what is that actually equal to if the value of interest is k plus 1? Well, it's going to be k plus 1 in the numerator and then k plus 1 plus 1, which is k plus 2 in the denominator. So we want to show that this sum combines together to give us the version of our shortened formula associated with k plus 1, which would be this. So all of this, this entire sum, needs to evaluate to this value when we simplify it. So our next step is to use our inductive hypothesis. So just like with the last example, notice what we have when we look at all of these terms. We have all of the terms associated with our inductive hypothesis with p sub k, which we assumed to be true. We assumed that that particular sum was equal to k over k plus 1. So in place of those terms, using my inductive hypothesis, I'm going to replace them with the abbreviated k over k plus 1. So the first k terms sum up to k over k plus 1, and then we still have the additional term that was added on associated with our new subscript k plus 1. Okay, so the goal is to get down to an expression k plus 1 over k plus 2. Well, automatically I know my final answer needs to be a single fraction. So the fact that I now have two fractions means I'm not quite there. So the first thing I may want to do is go ahead and get a common denominator. So we have a common factor of k plus 1 in our denominators. That means the first fraction also needs k plus 2. So I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by k plus 2. So this is equal to k times k plus 2 over k plus 1 times k plus 2. And to that we are adding our term 1 over k plus 1 times k plus 2. Okay. So keep going. Now we can combine together our two numerators and I'm going to go ahead and distribute as well. So k times k is going to be k squared and then k times 2 plus 2k plus 1 and all of that is over k plus 1 times k plus 2. Now you may be wondering why did I not go ahead and distribute in the denominator? Well, as I look towards the answer I know I want to get, I know I need a k plus 2 in the denominator. And I already have one of them. Somehow I need to get rid of the k plus 1. So leaving this in a factored form leaves me in a position where I may be able to cancel out what I don't want and just leave what I do want. 
So I'm going to leave that denominator in the factored form um, just in anticipation of what I expect to see at the very end. Now the numerator I then can factor. So once we combine everything together we have a new trinomial in the numerator and we can factor that. So the numerator we're looking for numbers that multiply to give 1 and also add to give 2. So that's going to be 1 and 1. So the numerator would factor as k plus 1 times k plus 1 and then again in our denominator we have k plus 1 times k plus 2. So notice we now have a common factor that's going to divide out leaving us with k plus 1 over k plus 2 which is exactly what we wanted and why did we want this? Well remember this is the version of our formula that would be associated with n is equal to k plus 1. So k plus 1 over k plus 1 plus 1 which is k plus 2. So that, that proves our statement. So we showed that the first case p sub 1 is true so since p sub 1 is true and since our assumed generic case implies the truth of the next case since p sub k being true implies that p sub k plus 1 is also true in other words any case implies that the next is true we conclude that the statement is true for all positive integers so the first one is true and every individual case implies the next so p sub 1 is true which means the next one p sub 2 would be true and then p sub 2 implies p sub 3, p sub 3 implies p sub 4, and then so on and so forth. So it's true for all positive integers. Okay, let's look at another one. Okay, we want to use mathematical induction to prove that 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus 2 cubed, you can probably see the pattern, all the way up to 2 raised to the n minus 1 power evaluates to the same thing as 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, so let's show that this relationship is true when n is equal to 1. So what is our sum? Well the sum is just going to be the first term or the term associated with n is equal to 1 so that's going to be 2 raised to the 1 minus 1 power which is 2 to the 0 power and anything to the 0 power is just 1 so the sum evaluates to 1. What about the other side? Well if we look at the formula and apply the formula when n is equal to 1 then 2 to the n minus 1 is equal to 2 to the first power minus 1 which is equal to 2 minus 1 which is equal to 1. So our sum evaluates to 1 and our formula evaluates to 1 as well. Therefore, p sub 1, our most basic case, is true. Okay, now we want to show that our generic case, p sub k, implies the truth of p sub k plus 1. So we make our inductive hypothesis. So assume p sub k, the statement associated with n is equal to k, assume that it's true. So in other words, assume that 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus 2 cubed plus all of the terms up to the k term, which will be 2 to the k minus 1 assume that that sum evaluates using this formula. So assume that it is equal to 2 to the k minus 1. We're assuming that's true. So using this assumption we want to show that the statement would also be true for k plus 1. Not just k but the next case as well. So what would the case look like if we're looking at k plus 1? Well again we're going to have all the same terms as the one we previously saw plus the term associated with n is equal to k plus 1. So that would be k plus 1 minus 1 which comes out to just k. So our sum for k plus 1 would be 1 plus 2 
plus 2 squared plus 2 cubed plus all the way up to the term associated with k plus 1, which again would be an exponent of k. Now again, to get to an exponent of k, we're also adding up the terms with all of the preceding exponents, which includes the term with the exponent of k minus 1 plus that additional term we get associated only with k plus 1. Okay, so here's our sum. What does this need to evaluate to? So let's make a note over to the side. If this relationship is in fact true, then the formula will also evaluate to the same value. So what will the formula be? Well, if we're going to allow n to be k plus 1, then this is going to come out to 2 to the k plus 1 power minus 1. So 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. So we want to show that our sum evaluates to the same thing as this expression, showing thereby that our formula is in fact true um, for one case and the next. Okay, so replace our terms associated with our inductive hypothesis. So based on our assumption, the first k terms could also be written as 2 to the k minus 1. So the first k terms we'll replace with 2 to the k minus 1, and then we're adding on our additional term that was associated with the next part of the statement with k plus 1. Okay, so based on that, we now have two terms that are considered like terms. So we have 2 to the k and then another 2 to the k. So we have 2 of 2 to the k. That's going to be one way to write that. So we have 1 plus another. We have two of them in total. And then we have that minus 1 right there. Now this 2 out front, we could think of that as a 2 to the first power. And one of the rules for exponents says that if we're multiplying together two exponential expressions with the same base, then we can combine them together into one expression where our exponents are added together. So 2 times 2 to the k is the same thing as 2 to the k plus 1 power, where I add those exponents together and give them the common base of 2. And then we have our minus 1. And notice that's exactly what we wanted. So that verifies this relationship. So the relationship was true when n is equal to 1. So p sub 1 is true. We verified that. And then the assumption of p sub k implies that the following case, p sub k plus 1, would also have to be true. So we conclude that the statement is true for all positive integers. Okay, let's try one more like this, associated with sums, adding up terms, and then we'll look at a variation of how we might use mathematical induction for a different kind of proof. So we want to use mathematical induction to prove that a sum, okay, so we see our summation notation, the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the terms associated with i squared will sum to the following value, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Okay, so first off, we want to show that p sub 1 is true when n is equal to 1. What does that mean for the summation notation? That means we're just allowing the upper limit to be 1, so we're only summing from 1 to 1. In, only one, in other words, we're only summing the term associated with i is equal to 1. So the sum is... the sum from i is equal to 1 all the way up to 1 of i squared, which means we're just summing with i is equal to 1, so that's going to be 1 squared, which is just equal to 1. And what do we get from our formula? Well, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6 evaluated when n is equal to 1. That's going to be 1 times 1 plus 1, which is 2, times 
2 times 1, which is 2, plus 1, which is 3, over 6. Well, 1 times 2 times 3 is 6, so 6 divided by 6 is 1. So our sum evaluates to 1, our formula evaluates to 1, therefore, P sub 1 is true. Okay, so now we'll make our inductive hypothesis. So assume that this relationship is true for some value k. Now be careful here because notice we have the index of summation and then n is associated as the upper limit of that. So now k will replace n. We still have our index of summation though. So there's going to be a couple of variables involved here. n is what we're replacing with the value k. So we're going to assume that the sum of the terms from i is equal to 1 to k of terms of the form i squared is equal to the value of this formula we would get when n is equal to k. So it's equal to k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 all over 6. So we're assuming that that relationship is true. So now we want to show that that assumption implies that the next case must also be, truth, be um, truthful. So in other words, when we sum from i is equal to 1, not only to k, but up to k plus 1. So when we sum, adding in the next term as well. So what's the sum going to look like associated with k plus 1? Well, we're going to have the sum of i is equal to 1 up now to k plus 1 for all our terms that look like i squared. Now let's write out what those terms actually look like. Okay, so what is that actually going to look like when we add up all of those terms? Well, if we start at 1, that's going to be 1 squared, and then we progress to 2, so plus 2 squared, and then 3, so plus 3 squared, all the way up to k plus 1, which means we also have to add up k squared as well as k plus 1 squared. Okay, and what do we want to show that all of this is equal to? Well, we want to show that this is equal to the value of our formula that we would get when n is equal to k plus 1. So what's that going to be? Well, let's write this out in a couple steps. So we would have k plus 1 times k plus 1 plus 1, which would be k plus 2, times, I'm running out of space, 2 times k plus 1 plus 1. All of that divided by 6. So let's simplify that down a little bit. So we have k plus 1 times k plus 2, and then what would our last factor actually come out to be? Well, we'd have 2 times k, which is 2k, so times 2k, and then 2 times 1, which is 2, plus that additional 1, which would be 3. And then all of that divided by 6. So when we evaluate this sum, simplify it down using again our inductive hypothesis, we should be able to evaluate to a sum um, that looks like that. Okay, now what I want you to notice is these first k terms. It's expanded, but it's really just the same thing as adding up all of the terms of the form i squared, where i is equal to 1, all the way up to where i is equal to k. So the first k terms in this expansion actually are the same thing as the sum we have written above, which again is not surprising because that's what we've seen with all of these problems. So in place of those first k terms, I can substitute the expression associated with my inductive hypothesis, which is k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 divided by 6.
and again, why is that? Well, the first k terms, that's really just i squared, where i goes from 1 to k, which is exactly what we have represented right here, and we assume that it's equal to this expression associated with our proposed formula. So here's our substitution with the inductive hypothesis, and to that we're adding on the one extra term that we have that was specifically associated with this particular statement. So we're adding on k plus 1 squared. Okay, now like in a previous example, we now have something that is fractional plus something else, okay, and we want our final answer to be a single fraction. So probably a good thing to do is go ahead and get a common denominator. So I'm going to multiply k plus 1 squared by 6 on top and bottom. Okay, so we have, if we write everything out combined together, we have k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 plus 6 times k plus 1 squared, if I go ahead and combine my numerators. And all of that is now divided by our common denominator of 6. Okay, so kind of like we saw again in a previous example, notice that we now have two big terms with multiple factors and they have a common factor of k plus 1. Okay, so I'm going to factor out that common factor. And why would I think to do that necessarily? Well, my denominator is already what I want. Notice I want a factor of k plus 1. So factoring out that common k plus 1 is going to give me this k plus 1 that I want as part of my final answer. So I'm going to factor that out since it is common. And let's write what we have left. So from the first term, we still have our k and our 2k plus 1. So k times 2k plus 1. And then from the second term, we had k plus 1 squared. We only factored out one of them, so we're left with one of them. And then the 6 as well, so plus 6 times the remaining k plus 1. And then don't forget our denominator. Okay, so we're not quite there, but we're closer. We have our k plus 1, we have our 6. So everything else, at least in theory, should come from what remains. So probably a good idea to go ahead and distribute everything that's inside the brackets and combine things together, and then maybe we can refactor and get the result we want. So we still have our k plus 1. Now when we distribute in parentheses, k times 2k is going to be 2k squared, k times 1, positive k, 6 times k, positive 6k, and then 6 times 1, positive 6. All of that over 6. And I'm going to need to go back up to the top, give myself a little more space. Okay, so combining our two like terms in the middle, we have k and 6k. So we now have k plus 1 times 2k squared plus 7k plus 6. And all of that is divided by 6. So now we need to factor that trinomial in the numerator. And I recommend take a minute, pause the video, make sure you can factor this. And what you'll notice is when you factor that, of course, we still have our k plus 1, but that, that particular trinomial, is going to factor as, not surprisingly, k plus 2 and 2k plus 3. And of course, we can verify that factorization by redistributing. So k times 2k is going to be 2k squared, and then we have 3k plus 4k which gives us the 7k, and then 2 times 3 is going to give us 6. So that is the correct factorization. And notice we now have exactly what we want. We have our k plus 1, our k plus 2, our 2k plus 3, and our denominator of 6. So that verifies that we do reach the right conclusion based on our inductive hypothesis. So since our first case, p sub 1, is true, and since p sub k's truth 
its assumption of truth implies the truth of the next case for arbitrary k. We conclude again that our statement is true for all positive integers. So you'll notice all of these have been pretty formulaic in terms of how we've approached the problem. We make sure that p sub 1 is true, okay, and in this case for the ones we've looked at so far, um, that's involved a sum. So we evaluated the sum on the left hand side, we evaluated the proposed formula, we show that they evaluate to the same number, which shows us that our basic first case is true. Then we form our inductive hypothesis, assume the statement is true when n is equal to k, that arbitrary value k, and then what really becomes formulaic is what happens after that. So we express the statement associated with not k, but k plus 1, noting that the version of the statement associated with k is also embedded within it, just plus that one additional term. And so using our inductive hypothesis, we replace the first k terms with the formula, and then it's just a matter of using our basic algebraic skills to simplify from there. So getting a common denominator, factoring, distributing, all of those kinds of skills that we use on a regular basis. So now let's switch gears and let's look at an example of using induction um, in a slightly different way. Not necessarily to prove a formula associated with a sum, but to prove a different kind of relationship associated with positive integers. So another type of situation where mathematical induction is helpful to prove relationships is involving divisibility. In other words, showing that certain numbers are factors of other numbers. So in this particular case, we want to show that 4 is a factor of 9 to the n power minus 1 for any positive integer n. Okay, so first off, we need to show that this is true when n is equal to 1. So we're not going to look at two sides of a sum here because there's no sum, but we need to look at the number that would result from 9, in, 9 to the n power minus 1 if we allow n to equal 1. So if n is equal to 1, then 9 to the n power minus 1 is going to be equal to 9 to the first power minus 1, which is equal to 9 minus 1, which is 8. And we know, of course, that 4 is a factor. It divides in evenly to 8. 4 is a factor of 8. Therefore, P sub 1, our first case, is true. Okay, so now we form our inductive hypothesis. What does the statement look like if we're allowing n to take on a value of k? What are we assuming? We're assuming that 4 is a factor of 9 to the k power minus 1. We're assuming that's true. Now, that's just a statement in words, and in general, in order to use our inductive hypothesis, we typically need some type of algebraic expression of that relationship. So how do we express algebraically that 4 is a factor of 9 to the k minus 1? Well, the way we express it is by noting that 9 to the k minus 1, if 4 is a factor, then 9 to the k minus 1 would be equal to 4 times some other number. So if this number is divisible by 4, if 4 is a factor of that number, then another way of writing this number is as 4 times some other value, which will happen to be an integer. So this is the algebraic way of expressing the fact that 4 is a factor of this number, or the assumption that 4 is a factor of that number. So based on that, we then need to show that the value we would get when k plus 1 is substituted um, also has 4 as a factor. So first off, what does this look like for k plus 1? Okay, well we would have 9 to the k plus 1 power minus 1. Okay, so that would be the number under consideration. And we need to somehow relate this back to the algebraic relationship we have expressed in our inductive hypothesis. So I notice there's a 9 to the k. 
This 9 to the k plus 1 is kind of a problem, but not really, because we have another way to write this using a relationship we actually looked at a little bit ago. So we use this in reverse. We combined two things with the same base together by adding their exponents. Well, if we have an exponent that's also a sum, we can also rewrite that as two exponential expressions split up that happen to have the same base. So 9 to the k plus 1 power is the same thing as 9 to the k power times 9 to the first power. It's just reversing that rule that we used previously. And then of course we're subtracting 1 from that. So I now notice this 9 to the k power, okay, and this is common to what we have in the inductive hypothesis. So I'm going to take this relationship that I wrote in the inductive hypothesis and I'm going to rearrange it a little bit so that I have something that will substitute in place of 9 to the k power. So if I were to isolate 9 to the k in this relationship, then I would get 9 to the k is equal to 4a plus 1. Just take that 1 and move it over. So in place of 9 to the k, based on everything that resulted from my inductive hypothesis, I can substitute 4a plus 1. So rewriting that in a slightly better way, that substitution is going to be multiplied by 9. So I'm going to put the 9 out front, and then again we're substituting 4a plus 1, and then we have that minus 1 on the outside. So the goal is to now show that whatever this number is, it has to be a number that's divisible by 4. It has to be a number that 4 divides into. So we just need to distribute and clean this up and see if that is in fact the case. So I'm going to distribute the 9, which is going to give me 36a plus 9, and then we have our minus 1 still. And so then we can combine the like terms, which is going to give me 36 a plus 8. And notice now that these two constants, 36 and 8, these are both numbers that are divisible by 4. In fact, 4 is the greatest common factor among the terms in this expression. So I'm going to factor out that 4, which would leave me with a 9a and a positive 2. So if this number can be written in such a way that 4 is clearly a factor, then that confirms the truth of the statement p sub k plus 1, because 4 is clearly a factor based on this factorization. So that's our proof. So we showed that p sub 1 is true. We showed that 9 to the n minus 1 in the case where n is equal to 1 would be a number, in this case 8, that has 4 as a factor. And then we also wrote out the inductive hypothesis, assuming that the generic number, 9 to the k minus 1, um, has 4 as a factor. This was the algebraic way of expressing that. And then based on that, the number that results from k plus 1 is also something that will have 4 as a factor. So p sub 1 is true, and the statement p sub k, its truth, implies the truth of the following statement p sub k plus 1. Therefore we conclude that the statement p sub n is true for all positive integers. So this is just a small sample of the kinds of problems that you can handle using um, mathematical induction. Again, this is a very powerful technique that's used by mathematicians in real life. So we're focusing on the components of this associated with what we've looked at recently, which are sequences and series. But keep in mind, particularly if you take more mathematics, um, you'll revisit this kind of concept and you'll use it in different contexts as well.